Have you ever been completely immersed in a story, either one that you're watching or one that you're reading, so engaged that you forget where you are? Maybe you even forget who you are. That's the power of stories, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to talk about The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall, and the summary article is in the description if you want to click that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how to tell stories better. And why would you want to tell stories better? Well, because when you tell stories better, you can captivate people better, and you can be more convincing, and you can make friends easier. So all that and more, but first, you know the drill. Please, please, please like and subscribe. And if you're so inclined, comment. Tell me what your favorite story is. And it can be a movie or it can be a book that you read or even a short story. Or if you wrote a story, uh, put it in the comments too. And then other people watching the video can read your story and we can all tell stories to each other. Uh, all right, cool, thanks. Like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Share, share this with your friends. This is how we can promote this channel. In the book, The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall, he explores the idea that maybe it's not our intelligence as humans that defines us, but it is our ability to tell stories and perhaps our addiction and our desire to hear and consume stories. And there's some really interesting evidence for this. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that when we're kids, we start telling stories really early on in life. And for kids, when they tell stories, uh, the stories seem much more real to them. Playing pretend is only really pretend to adults. Kids are simulating things in their minds when they tell each other stories, play pretend. The interesting thing is, and this is what Jonathan Gottschall talks most about, is when we're watching or reading or listening to stories, we, even as adults, are simulating what's happening in the story in our minds. So for example, there was a study that showed some people uh, when they were exposed, sorry, many people when exposed to an angry person on a screen uh, would end up having an angry reaction in their brain. Basically the part of their brain associated with anger would light up. So they would see what's happening on the screen, simulate it in their mind, and experience it as if it were real for themselves. So just honing in on this idea that when we consume stories, we are simulating them for ourselves, how can we apply it to our lives in a meaningful way? Well, one way is to consider what we choose to simulate. So for instance, if you're watching a lot of crime dramas, which are really entertaining, they're super addicting, but they're very violent, you might have a bias towards perceiving violence in your world. You might have a vi uh, uh, sorry. You might have a bias towards negativity. You might think the world is out to get you because of what you're consuming. So I'm not telling you what to watch or even how to watch it. What I'm suggesting is that perhaps, based on how you feel after watching something, you can be more discerning with what you choose to put in your mind, just like you are more discerning with what you choose to put in your body when you're eating. You don't always eat french fries every day, all day, because it's bad for you. And likewise, you should regulate the amount of trashy content that you're consuming that makes you feel bad. Uh, on the other hand, you could also take this time when you're resting and stimulating your mind even further. So say you want to learn a new language, you might consider picking shows in the language that you're trying to learn so that you can enjoy the story itself, but also you're sort of amplifying your ability to speak the language that you're trying to learn. But it is really powerful to recognize that everything that you are consuming visually, audibly, uh, auditorily, is that the right way? Um, everything that you're consuming through these shows is going in, is simulating environments, and is leading to uh, a change in your identity. Uh, as Jonathan Gottschall says, the stories we consume shape us radically. And when you change your identity, it actually leads to changes in your personality. So if stories can have such an impact on us, who's telling these stories? Well, all of us are telling stories all the time. Even though right now, this is me just sort of telling you about stories, it's sort of a story about stories, right? Um, when you tell a joke to a friend, you're telling stories. When you vent to a loved one about the injustice of a coworker who's, you know, just putting you in such an unfair position, you're telling a story. 
So how can we tell stories better? How can we tell stories to be more impactful on our audience, on our communities, on our friends, and our family? Well, there's a lot of information that we could pull from, and I just want to focus on one concept. So it's rooted in this book called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, this is a Joseph Campbell book. It's super famous by now. Link in the description to that as well if you're interested in the original source material. A lot of people have explored this book and then simplified it into an easier to use format. One of those people is the creator of Rick and Morty and Community. His name is Dan Harmon. And he talks about the story circle. Lots of people talk. Uh, on YouTube, you can Google uh, a deep breakdown of the story circle with even beat by beat explanations of episodes of Rick and Morty of how it applies. You can find that stuff. I'm not gonna get into that now. I just wanna expose you to the power of the structure of story so that you can apply it in your life. So let's start with a basic story, the bad version of the story. There's this guy, he's a painter, but he's broke. So because he needs money, he ends up uh, joining a marketing firm, uh, teaching painters how to paint, um, and he makes a bunch of money. When he realizes that all he really wants to do is, is paint, he goes back to painting. Okay, that's an okay story. I mean, like, sure, it's fine. It's, a, it's got the arc. Um, but let's try to make it a little bit more interesting using a very specific structure. Um, notice the details I decide to put in now that I'm talking about uh, this story as, as if it's engaging. So there's this guy uh, named Jason, and Jason's been painting his whole life. He loves painting, um, but Jason realizes uh, that rent is due in just a few days, and uh, he can't pay rent because he hasn't sold any art. Um, but uh, while he's out getting groceries, he happens to run into this guy in a suit who finds out that he's an artist. And he says, well, um, if you want to co come join my marketing firm, we need people like you. He goes, well, I do need rent. So I guess I'm going to take this job. And in the course of taking the job, he thinks in the back of his head all the time about how he used to just paint every day. And now all he does is write emails every day. And he makes a bunch of money. It turns out he's really, really good at this and he becomes an executive himself. Over the course of three months, he becomes the top executive in this marketing agency, right? So he pays his bills, he gets a new apartment, he gets a Rolex and he gets a suit and he goes back to the place that he used to paint at, this lake. And he looks around and he sees this guy who's broke and he's painting and he's smiling. And Jason goes up to him and he goes, hey, aren't you worried about paying your bills? And the guy's like, well, I might not be able to pay my bills, but at least I'm doing what I love. And Jason realizes in that moment, well, it wasn't ever about the money. It was always about the art. And he quits his job and he goes back to painting. But since he learned how to market for all of these other people, he learns how to market his painting better. And even though he gave up the money, he ended up getting it all because he learned how to sell his paintings better online. And happy ending, uh, he, he gets married and he sails off into the distance he's rich and he's he's painted a bunch of stuff that people love he's famous right? um okay so i may have put a little too much detail in the second story i got a little indulgent indulgent um but hopefully you notice that the first story with very few details and very few uh plot points that are interesting uh you might have like not really cared about this guy who we didn't know at the time was named jason and his journey through his artistic um, experience, right? But now in the second story, we can see with these specific plot points uh, that uh, each one is engaging in an interesting and sort of inexplicable way, right? We get sucked into the story. So let me explain that inexplicable way. So introducing Dan Harmon's story circle. I don't know which side it's going to be on. Um, there are eight points on this clock, and each point is a plot point. Everything on the second bottom half of the circle, you can think of as the unknown. Everything on the top half is the known. Put it up to this side. Um, so it's you are in a place of comfort, need something, so you go in search of it. You find it, you take it, then you return having changed. So I don't know if you were counting the fingers, but that's eight different parts of the story circle. So. Let's look at the story that I told and why I put those specific details. Jason is you. You project yourself onto this artist named Jason, but he has a need. He needs to pay rent. And he goes 
somewhere looking for money, right? Maybe at this point he goes to the grocery store and he searches for a way to make money through his painting. Um, and in the new situation, he finds the solution to his need, but he has to pay a hefty price. In this case, he pays the price of not really being an artist anymore. And then he returns home, right, right back to the place where he used to paint, having changed, realizing he's not much of an artist. And then he makes a choice. Does he go back to his old ways or does he continue with his new ways? That's actually a new story, right? The epilogue itself is kind of a new story, but that in itself is what makes this story engaging, right? You need, go, search, find, take, return, change. Simplified into its most basic human elements. And as I said at the beginning, everything in the bottom half of the circle is the unknown and everything in the top half of the circle is the known. There's a lot of psychology behind why this is powerful, and it's actually from Jungian psychology originally, right? Joseph Campbell was influenced by Jung. I'm not gonna get into it. It's really good stuff. But the interesting thing to remember that we can apply is if we frame our own stories, if we practice this a couple of times, even if we miss a couple of steps, when we're telling stories, either in business or in our personal relationships, you can architect them around these eight points on this dial. And if you do, you'll be surprised that people will respond a little differently. Your stories will be more engaging, right? Just like the story about Jason the artist, even though you know it's not a great story, I literally made it up off the top of my head, uh, right? It's more engaging than the original facts of the story, and that's what we can apply in our own lives. So that is, in a nutshell, the impact that stories have on us as explored by Jonathan Gottschall in The Storytelling Animal. Check out the summary in the description if you want more of that. And this is how to tell better stories. Use the story circle. Give it a shot in your life. Practice it. Try to see if there are stories you know uh, that you can deconstruct into these eight points on a dial and uh, see what happens when you tell a few stories. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think about the story circle as well in the comments. If you made it this far, um, I think a lot of people will probably have already commented early on, but if you haven't, comment again. Like it again if you can, you know, and hit that subscribe button, hit that bell, I don't know, smash all the nice things. Um, and we just launched something, it's in its earliest stage, we launched Safanat subscriptions. So if you're really excited about this content and you wanna start supporting us right away, you can go through the link also, that'll, it'll be the first link in the description uh, if you click on that, it'll take you to a donation page. We barely set this up. You can subscribe through there to a monthly subscription or an annual subscription or just a one-time donation. Um, more to come later about what that actually gets you. Right now, it's just donation-based, and we would appreciate it if, if you want to support the uh, the network and you want to support the community of people that we're building and you want to support this, these ideas. Um, but pretty soon, there'll be formal subscriptions that'll actually get you something really cool. We'll announce that through the website, through the email, so just stay tuned. Um, thanks for listening. Hopefully you got some value out of this and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Oof, man. It's one of those days. Also, if you're watching now, I'm scruffy because it's November. Um, I know I was going to mention that earlier in the video, but, um, yeah, it's gross. And I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? I don't really, I really don't like it. And then historians, they're going to find this video a million years from now and say, look at this scruffy guy. No, they don't care.